from Washington, D.C., this is Middle East Focus. Hello and welcome to Middle East Focus, a weekly podcast on regional affairs and U.S. policy produced by the Middle East Institute in Washington, D.C. I'm Renda Slim, Director of the Conflict Resolution and Track to Dialogues program at the Middle East Institute. Sitting in for Alistair Taylor, who hosts the Middle East Focus podcast and who is on vacation this week. Iraq is experiencing the aftermath of a political earthquake. This earthquake, which has rattled Iraq's political landscape, happened on June 12, when Mr. Muqtada al-Sadr, whose political bloc won the most seats in the October 2021 parliamentary elections, asked all 73 parliamentarians who are affiliated with his movement to submit their resignations, which they promptly did. According to Iraqi election law, if a seat becomes vacant, the candidate with the highest score in the electoral district shall replace its holder. This meant that candidates affiliated with the coordination framework, the second Shia bloc in the Iraqi parliament, and Mr. Assadr's political opponents, stood to increase their share of seats and become the largest parliamentary bloc. On June 23, the Iraqi parliament, currently in recess until the end of July, held an extraordinary session to swear in the new members of parliament who replaced the Sadrist who resigned. To discuss these developments and their implications on Iraq's political trajectory, I'm joined today by two Iraqi scholars, both based in Baghdad. Dr. Mersin Ashamari, a research fellow at the Middle East Initiative at the Harvard Kennedy School, and Mr. Farhad Alaeddin, chairman of the Iraqi Advisory Council. Welcome, Marcin. Welcome, Farhad. Thank you, Randa. Thank you, Randa. Good to be with you. Thank you. Let me start with you, Marcin. What prompted Mr. Assadr's decision, and what will be its impact on the Sadrist movement's political trajectory? Randa, that's an excellent question. And there's several schools of thought about why we are where we are now. And if we go back to the elections in October, immediately afterwards, Sadr was on a campaign of creating a majority government. Iraq, traditionally, since its first elections in 2005, has been doing consensus governments where all the political parties come together and form a government of consensus you know, decide government formation that way. He has been adamant about a majority and an opposition, and he has been adamant about placing his rival Shia parties in the opposition, so specifically Nur al-Maliki's party in the opposition. He was doing this by creating a alliance with Muhammad al-Halbusi, who's the Speaker of Parliament, and with the Kurdistan Democratic Party. And this tripartite alliance was pushing for having a majority government. But one of the reasons Sadr got frustrated and had his MPs resign, according to what I've been hearing from political elite, is that he didn't feel that his partners in this campaign, in this majority government campaign, were as serious as him and that they were flirting too much with the other Shia parties of the coordination framework and thus weren't serious enough for him to continue with them, and it was a moment of frustration. Now, this is one hypothesis. The other hypothesis that you hear more often on the Iraqi street, so less among the political elite, is that Muqtada Sadr was threatened by Iran into resigning his MPs, because he has been going on about himself being a nationalistic figure, kind of positioning himself as you know anti-Iran, And Iran, for the most part, is supportive of a broad coalition of Shia parties and doesn't want to see this disunity among them. So that is the hypothesis in Iraqi media, actually, as well as in the street. And interestingly enough, Muqtada Sadr released a statement saying that he wasn't threatened by Iran, which really raises a question of mark of what really happened there if you feel the need to say that you weren't threatened. And lastly, I mean... One of the things that's being said by analysts and is another hypothesis as to why we're here right now is that he decided that he wants to play the long game of street politics rather than invest in the political system or be held accountable for the political system 
if a protest movement happens or if the Iraqi state is unsatisfied with the trajectory of the political elite going forward. Now, that being said, we have to keep in mind that where we are today, which is his MPs resigned, some of their replacements have been sworn in, and he is you know, officially out of parliament. Nevertheless, no one expects that his representatives, his guides, his men in office will still occupy positions in particular ministries or in other governmental positions. So we're still unclear about how removed he's going to be. But there is a hypothesis that he is trying to put himself on the side of the street rather than the side of the system in anticipation of kind of um, not necessarily a system breakdown, but a, a clash of sorts. Farhad, building on what Marcin just said in terms of the different schools of thought about why Mr. Assadr resigned, how do you think Sadr's decision changed the political dynamics in Iraq and what are the likely future scenarios? We are in a new territory as far as the Iraqi politics is concerned after 2003, where it's for the first time we have the Sadrist bloc not present in the parliament and not represented within the political system as such. And that creates a big gap in, in the political representation of a large segment of the Shia population, which is represented by the Sadrists. And their voice will not be heard within the, the political system. And that, that creates a problem in many ways and fear, as been mentioned already, that a matter of street politics and street protest and stuff like that that could break out as a result of this withdrawal. However, the political parties have taken this matter in their stride and they moved along and, and replaced the resigned Sadrist members with the replacements and parliament was held on 23rd of June, a special session, extraordinary session for that. And through that, they basically have gone past the decision of Sadr. And now they want to move along into a government formation process just after the parliament recess, which is expected to be just after eight, around mid-July. And now they are engaged in finding the coalition that will rule and more importantly, to choose a prime minister. So really right now, all the scenarios that have been talked about is more to do with who's going to become prime minister and who gets what ministry. In the session of parliament on 23rd of June, there was a statement that was read by Ahmed al-Asadi, which clearly had uh, hallmarks of a new political deal that's been reached with the Kurdistan Democratic Party and the Sovereignty Alliance, both partners of Sadr and the Tripartite Alliance. And it was clear that there was negotiations uh, behind the scene. And one of the results of that negotiation that the speaker managed to amend the bylaws of the parliament where he becomes the president or the speaker and uh, separated himself and his authority with the two deputies that he has. And that was a problem he had with the Sadrist deputy earlier. And they, in the statement also they mentioned issues that concerns the KRG in, in general, especially the petroleum law, the KRG is very concerned about. And the passing of that law, or legislating that law is important to, to them. So it, it was clear that a lot of negotiations have taken place in order to make sure all the political parties are going to take part. And the statement made it also clear there's going to be a consensus government that will include everyone without any exclusion, apart from the Sadrist, obviously. So this is, in the political term, this is really the scenarios that's in our hand. But on the other side of this coin is going to be the failure of this government, if it happens, and what comes after summer would be a, two different things. And I don't believe that the Sadrist have left the political scene and gave up all their seats and their parliamentary representation just to hand it over and say goodbye. There will be repercussions and there will be an attempt by the Sadrist to come back in a different way. But I don't believe it's going to be through the same system that we have now, through elections and the same constitution and so on. It, 
they have been talking about regime change and, and maybe this is what they would be aiming for. So there is a scenario that is being discussed, especially in D.C., of possibility of holding early elections, especially if the Sadrists decide to move into street protest mode and then just force early election. How, how likely is this, Farhad? It's very unlikely because early election means continuation of the current system. Election on its own is never a solution because the problems that leads to the election, the election law itself is, there's a lot of dispute about it as what system. Majority of those who are now going to be in power never wanted the current election law. So they would like to go back to the proportional representation that was the old system and not the SNTV, and that is the Sadrists will no, never won that. Also, there is debate about who's going to be managing the IHEC and so on. In addition that holding an election, you're talking about at least a year's preparation. Logistically, you need at least a year. That's if you have managed to amend the law to be an acceptable law and so on. So it is something that is impractical, and it's never a solution for the problems that that Iraq faces, the crisis that we have. And therefore, it's not practical. Orsin, there have been calls recently for Grand Ayatollah Ali Assistani to intervene and play an arbiter, uh, you know, mediator role managing the conflict between the Sadrists and the coordination framework, the two leading Shia political blocs in Iraq. In fact, one member of the coordination framework, Mr. Hadi Al-Amiri, is the head of Al Fatah is the one who made this call, call uh, you know, for Mr. Uh, for Grand Ayatollah Ali Sistani to interfere, and we have seen the Marjaiya in the past interfere, you know, issue statements, make its position known when Iraq was at a you know critical point in its political trajectory. You are an expert on the Marjaiya. How do you see the Marjaiya right now evaluating the situation, and what do you think are tr- potential trigger points that could force it to intervene. One of the things that I enjoy watching about the Marjaya is that they're very stable in how they approach issues. So you can always assess how they're going to react to a situation. Now, if we take a long view of the role of the Marjaya and Najaf towards politics generally in Iraqi history, whether pre or post-2003, they have as their top priority the preservation of their own system, of the religious establishment. And in order to do that, they try to preserve the political and economic stability of the community surrounding it. And so that really explains why historically they've tried to keep the status quo in Iraq and to avoid any upheaval. And if you speak to them in Najaf, one of the words that they use very often as one of the things that inspires them to get involved is they fear fulva, chaos. So to answer your question, sure, in a short way, if there is chaos, either on the Iraqi street or amongst the Shia community, they will intervene. Now, the nature of that intervention has changed a lot since 2003. One of the things that I like to point out to people about the role of the religious establishment since then is that it really entered an era that it had never experienced before, where for the first time in Iraq's history, the religious establishment was more or less on the same plane as the state in terms of, you know, they occupy the same ethno-religious group as the predominant group in the state. They don't have negative ties to the state. They don't have an antagonistic relationship to the state as they previously have. And this is uncharted territory for them. And since 2003, they've been learning how to manage it. And one of the lessons learned is that from 2005 up until 2018, they had a much too strong relationship whether intentionally or unintentionally, whether through co-optation or whether through willingness with the Islamist parties that have, I will say that have failed the Shia public since the first elections. And this all changed in the Tishreen protest movement when the religious establishment decided to really take a step back and reassess how they were perceived by the Iraqi public. They were paying a tax for their association with Islamist parties. As the Islamist parties fell out of favor with the Shia street, the Marjaya was in danger of falling out of favor, and it really needed the legitimacy of being accepted by the public. I mean, that's one of the pillars of its authority. It has to have public legitimacy. And so you saw in the protest movement that the line they took was, 
supportive of the protest movement, but only insofar as the protest movement's demands are channeled through legitimate state institutions, like the constitution, like elections, like the peaceful resignation of a prime minister, an interim government, early elections. They were very careful about the means through which to achieve change. And so going forward, what we can expect from them is if we hit this fova, this chaos on the Iraqi street, they will try to push for a resolution within the system. The Marjaya is not going to be revolutionary until a revolution is underway. They're not going to push for it. And they're actually going to work against it because it's hugely destabilizing. Now, within the Shia community, the Shia political community, so you're saying within the coordination framework and Muqtad al-Sadr, you know, there was a statement by one of Grand Ayatollah Sistani's representatives Sayyid Ahmed al-Safi, on the anniversary of the fatwa for Jihad al-Kifai, which is a fatwa that people see as having established the popular mobilization forces. And he made a subtle and somewhat direct demand, or he expressed that the religious establishment was paying attention to what was happening and wanted to see peaceful resolution. Now, that's what's being said on the surface. Do I think that there aren't messages that are going in, you know, subliminally or not directly that the public can't see. I'm sure there are other channels of communication where the religious establishment is pushing for Shia unity insofar as Shia unity brings stability to the country. But the religious establishment in a direct way will not get involved in the same way it has previously done in previous elections and because it just doesn't want to risk public legitimacy, particularly now when public perception of the state is so bad. It's not the time for the religious establishment to look like it's strengthening a relationship or that it has a hand in guiding or moving the government in any way. Building on what Marcin just said, referring to the statement by a representative of the Marja'iyya a few days ago, I mean, the way I read the statement is like he was, the subtle message which Marcin referred to was, you know, saying that somebody who ruled in the past, who, you know, and he, in my opinion, he was referencing Mr. Nur al-Maliki and who lost one third of Iraq uh, to ISIS, should not be eligible to lead the country again. I mean, that's at least my reading. So Farhad, I would be interested in hearing your reading of that statement. And then given that, who is the likely figure to become the next prime minister, given all these dynamics that are at play right now? The said statement, it has to be said that later on, Sayyid al-Safi issued another statement to say he is expressing his own views rather than the marja, Sayyid al-Sistani. So it is here that he was talking about the fatwa jihad al-Kifai and then what it meant in saving Iraq and, and so on. So it was the anniversary of that. And he referred to the political scene as that, that the marja is watching and observing and so on, but he quickly retracted from that to be, in a way, a reference to the marja himself. I wouldn't put a lot to it, to be honest with you. We all know uh, that uh, the marja'iyya very closely monitors what's going on and they care a lot about the street and they care about the, the well-being of the people. And we all know they are very, very unhappy with the political elite and the past, what, uh, 18 years of ruling. And they see how Iraq deteriorated within that period. So they are watching and they are they are hoping that the political leaders will come to their senses and to serving the Iraq and the Iraqis. As to your question as who's going to be the next prime minister, I think this is the mistake that we all make in the Iraqi process where we focus on the person and say who, and then we always end up with a, a wall and like eight, nine portraits of persons that are there, then you say, okay, this one, not that one, and the other. Clearly, this time is no different. We have the three top leaders of the framework, namely Nur al-Maliki, Had al-Amri, and Haider al-Abadi. All are positioning themselves to become prime ministers. they wanting it, and they are testing the waters. And then you have the second line, which is also always... The names I mentioned, and that is Qasim al-Araji, Muhammad Shia al-Sudani, Adnan Zulfi, Ali Shukri, Tarag Najm, Asad al-Aidani, and so on. So these are these names are always mentioned and get re-mentioned. But in reality, 
choosing the next prime minister is going to be a very difficult process because there are too many factors involved. And let's not forget also the incumbent prime minister at academy. He also is one of the hot contenders in the race. It's going to be a very protracted process to until they finalize the candidacy. There will be a lot of negotiations and it's not going to be easy at all by any means. And I personally expect a lot of delay until they reach consensus because everything is at stake this time. And it's very difficult to predict it's going to be X or Y. Marcin, I want to build on something you just said in answering to the question before Farhad, when you talked about the public perceptions of the states are pretty low these days. And you have been doing a lot of work on civil society and youth groups. And so if you can just share your findings about how they look at at this political development and in general, how do they look at the pathway to change within the political system? To really answer this question, I'm going to disaggregate the Iraqi public, particularly the youth, into different groups and answer the question for each of them. So if you'll allow me, I'll start with the group that is in parliament, actually. So the political parties that emerged from the protest movement and that found themselves in parliament. So mainly they're represented by Dad. So one of the things that we really haven't paid as much attention to is when the Sadrist resigned, one of the biggest winners from that resignation was actually Dad. They went from nine seats to 16 seats. And that's, that's a huge uh, seat gain for a party who, if you talk to them, their aspirations for the next election was to hit about 20. They have a step-by-step idea of how they want to amass more seats going in the future. And with 16 seats for Dad, I think that is one of the positive side effects of this debacle that we weren't really expecting. And what's really great about this as well, from my perspective, is that actually allowed a lot of women that had marginally lost to Sudrist women to get the quota seat in some places. And I think that is a tiny sliver of hope on a very confusing situation. But from their perspective, they're what I call reformists. They have walked the walk of reform, which means they decided that the best way to see change in Iraq was to move from the protest square to the parliament and see what they can do there. And obviously this journey for them and the fact that it's taken eight months and longer, as as Farhad just said, I mean, it's probably going to take much longer to form a government means it has really given them some time to fall into disarray. There's been a lot of uh, divisions amongst them. There's been a lot of debate, disunity. So it's not a a smooth transition, but it is one that is very much within the school of thought of reforming the Iraqi political system from within and focusing on small gains and particular agendas. That is particularly for, for a political party which has made this decision. If we move to look at the broader Iraqi public the youth that have participated in protest, then they fall into reformist camps and revolutionary camps. It's really hard to say when it comes down to it, what percentage are in each. I I haven't done the, the survey work to really figure this out, but I will venture, I guess, that the revolutionaries outnumber the reformists, mainly because reformists tend to be people who are well-versed in civil society, have been members of civil society, understand political processes and economic processes and understand how long change takes to achieve. They also understand how dangerous a revolution can be for Iraq. Meanwhile, revolutionaries are usually people who are rightfully very fed up with the everyday life in Iraq, lack of services, lack of employment, etc. And they think that, you know, a complete change of system is what is needed. And Like I said, I I don't really know the percentages of each, but their perception towards what has been happening in Iraq is that this is kind of the last chance for the political system to show that it can be reformed. Otherwise, a lot of the reformists will fall into the revolutionary camp. And a good measure of this is going to be people's willingness to turn out and vote. So immediately after October, when people were surprised by the number of seats that Intidad won and by the number of seats that some truly nonpartisan independents won, they said, oh, we should have participated. We should have you know, either voted or ran or you know, got involved in this. 
the appetite for this has waned a bit as government formation has dragged on and as the powerlessness of these individuals in parliament to impact the stalemate was revealed to the public. And since the appetite has lessened, if there really isn't anything to address it, anything to show that small reforms can be achieved, then what we're looking at is a growing revolutionary class that will manifest it, their disenchantment with the system in the least painful way by refusing to vote, by boycotting and depriving the system of legitimacy, and in the most painful way through outright revolution, which in Iraq's case can so very easily fall into civil war. I mean, building on Marcin, and also it's something relating to something you said earlier in this podcast, Farhad, I mean, do you really think that Sadr is interested in regime change? I mean, this is a regime that benefited him, you know, that financed his patronage system, prompted him to become the top Shia leader. I mean, do you see that him interested in pushing for regime change? I think his aspirations has evolved and gotten to a new level now after achieving so much success uh, year after year and election after election, where this election he he could see himself as the supreme leader. And in many ways, some of his behavior after the election results were announced indicated that that aspect, although never been said publicly or per se. I would say that he now has come to a conclusion that he cannot rule on his own and he has very little chance of become the person he wants to become with uh, being forced to share the power with so many other people where he cannot do it alone. And, and this is one thing that we can read from the Southwest literature, mostly in the discussions and in their publications where where we notice they talk a lot these days about regime change and this parliamentary system doesn't work. And especially after the Supreme Court, uh, the federal court ruling that to elect a president, you need two third. And that means that always one third could object and block any political development or any government formation without consensus. And this is something that doesn't appeal to him anymore although in the past he has been part of that system. So this is, if you put all this together, you could see, yes, he really have this idea and this desire now, and it could very well be that this is going to be his next move one way or another. He made it clear he's not going to take part anymore with this system and with this group of people. So it's either it's going to be the end of Sadrist as we know, or either a new regime. Final question, again to you, Farhad. President Biden is heading to the Middle East next month. Iraqi Prime Minister Mr. Mustafa Al-Qadhimi has been invited by the Saudi Crown Prince to attend a regional summit in Riyadh with President Biden. I have two questions, in fact, in the short period of time left for us. Uh, one, is this summit being discussed at all in Iraq or, you know, it's a non-event as far as the Iraqi political elites are concerned? And second is, what do you think a government led by the coordination uh, framework mean for future U.S.-Iraq relations? Well, the first question, it has been discussed in a negative way rather than a positive way. It's uh, mostly that when it was mentioned, they are, especially the hawks or the walais mostly, are seeing it as a way of normalization or a way of Israel uh, relations to do with the Gulf countries and so on. And now with this uh, talk about armament of the region and so on. So it is it is taken on that on that sense. But in reality, there is very little focus in the mainstream media or among the people as to the this event that is happening and and taking place and the prime minister has been invited to attend. Even among the elite, they pay little more attention to it because they see this is an America-Saudi relation affair or America-Saudi and the Gulf affair. And at the background is Israel also with it. So in many ways, Iraq is not featured in these talks and and it's just there as a participant being part of the region. Uh, So the focus is not on Iraq and Iraq is paid little attention. As to your second question, One of the themes that's been discussed right now among the 
even the framework leaders behind the scene is the next government must be a government that is acceptable to all and especially to the West and the United States, where they realize it's not going to be easy for them to to impose or to elect a prime minister that is at odds with the United States. The talk right now is not only about appointing somebody acceptable to the West, but actually supported by the West. So they're thinking along these lines right now, and we could very well see somebody that is not only acceptable, but supported by the West. That's all we have time for today. And thank you, Marcin and Farhat, for joining the program. And thank you to our listeners for tuning in and to our production team for their work on this week's episode. Reminder to our listeners, you can subscribe to Middle East Focus on Spotify, Apple Podcast, and other podcast provider. You can follow MEI's coverage of Iraq, as well as the many evolving dynamics, political and security dynamics in the Middle East, on our website at www.mei.edu. You can also follow MEI on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube and subscribe to our email newsletters for the latest analysis and information about upcoming events. And make sure to tune in to next week's podcast. This has been a presentation of the Middle East Institute. To support MEI's programs and podcasts, please donate at www.mei.edu. Thank you for your support.